Amen. Hey, well, if you are new with us, we are going through the Gospel of Mark, doing a verse by verse. So make sure you turn to Mark chapter 13. And while you're turning there, let me give you just a little uh, catch up of where we've been. Uh, it was Tuesday in our text. Uh, Jesus is going to be betrayed uh, by his, uh, one of his closest uh, friends, Judas. He is going to be arrested. He's going to have uh, several uh, illegal trials. This is happening in a couple of days. Uh, where Jesus has been is he's been in the temple. There's been some verbal attacks. Uh, the Pharisees and scribes are trying to trap Jesus, that if he would say something against the people, the masses would no longer follow him. If he says something against the government, the government would then arrest him. Uh, last Sunday, uh, Jesus was asked, what's the, the greatest commandment? And it was to love the Lord, uh, your God, uh, and the Lord, the, the Lord your God is one, but to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we ended off our time with Jesus saying, beware of the scribes. He talked about how the scribes were walking around their flowing robes and made broad their phylacteries. And then we ended our story with uh, the widow's might, where there was this uh, poor widow that uh, put in her all of her livelihood, the last two mites that uh, she had. So we talked about how it's crazy that most likely that these scribes did that to her. As we talk about that story, we tend to think of it as uh, some a great uh, action of, of faith and trust in God. But rarely uh, do people think about maybe the religious did that to her. So Jesus says, watch out for these religious people. Well, here in our text, we're going to get a glimpse uh, into end times. Actually, the next two to three weeks, we're going to talk about end times. And the title of the message this morning is A Glimpse of the End. A Glimpse of the End. And living in today's society, this, this is a pretty good picture of the glimpse of the end. And you know, the, the scary thing, family, is all that's going on today is just a glimpse. It is going to become uh, exponentially worse. And we look at today and we're going, how can it get worse? any worse? It's going to. It is going to. But as was prayed and as we talked about, Jesus is on his throne. So the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about uh, these, this glimpse and we're going to talk a little bit about the great tribulation. So Jesus will give us uh, many things to, uh, to think about. Well, let's uh, turn to Mark chapter 13. And when you get there, give us an amen. And if you're new to following you some Jesus, Mark is in the New Testament. It goes Matthew and then the book of Mark. And you want chapter 13. And let's read verses 1 through 13. Then we'll go back and talk about it. It says, Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign when all of these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began, answering them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be afraid, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the what? beginnings of sorrows, but watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. What does verse 10 say, family? And the what? The gospel must be preached first to who? All nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak, but whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak but to the Holy Spirit. Now, brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. 
and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be what? Save Jesus. Give us ears to hear your word today. If you are a note taker, we're going to jump right on in. Our first point this morning is it's all going away. It's all going away. So Jesus is uh, in the temple area. Uh, his disciples are, he's with his disciples, and one of them comments about the temple and about these, these great stones, and you'll see a, a picture of uh, the temple uh, here. Now, a little background. So uh, the temple in our text um, is uh, the second temple. The first one was destroyed by the Babylonians, and you can read that in 2 Kings chapter uh, 25. So Jesus is prophesying about this current temple in our text. Now, this current temple in our text was magnificent. It was rebuilt by uh, Ezra and Zerubbabel, and that's Ezra chapter, uh, chapter 6. But Herod greatly expanded uh, this temple. Uh, it is said uh, regarding this, uh, this expansion that, um, that there was gold overlaid on it. And then whenever the sun hit the gold, it was blinding. Um, Josephus says that uh, whatever wasn't gold was pure marble. So from a distance that uh, the, uh, the, the travelers thought they saw snow. So just imagine how magnificent, how breathtaking uh, this temple area was. So when the disciples were, were there, they're going, Jesus... Ta-da! Look at this magnificent temple. Look at how beautiful and glorious this temple is. Jesus says, there's not one stone that's going to remain. Now, you might be thinking, they would, they would hear that go, what do you mean? This, this temple, Herod began to build in 19 BC, and he completed it in 63 AD. I mean, so that's what, 80-something years that it took to build. It was magnificent. Uh, the Jews appreciated it. It was a beautiful, uh, it was part of their, uh, their worship. And Jesus says, not one stone is going to remain. Now, we need to talk a little bit about the book of Daniel, which we'll do a lot next week and the following week. In Daniel 9, 26, it says, And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war of desolations are determined. Again, we'll get into Daniel a little bit more next week in the following. Uh, one commentator says, after the Messiah is cut off, Jerusalem and her temple would be destroyed again by an overwhelming army, this flood. Most Bible scholars and commentators agree that this was fulfilled by the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., so Jesus tells his disciples that not one stone shall be left upon another. We have to ask ourselves, why weren't the disciples asking Jesus more about his death and his burial? Because in our, in our previous chapters of Mark, Jesus told them that the Son of Man will be betrayed, that he would be forsaken, but he is going to rise again. Why don't we read in the text that they're asking Jesus about, about that? But instead of asking Jesus about his death and resurrection, they're talking to him about a bunch of stones. Isn't that kind of crazy? You're thinking we have Jesus is going to be betrayed, he's going to be killed, and he's going to rise again from the dead, which no one has done and remained alive. So that's, that's a huge thing, but yet they see the temple, and they're all in awe of the temple when Jesus says this whole thing is going to go away. They're going to go, ooh, we've got some questions. Well, I want to know about the resurrection of the dead. I want you to tell me about, about that. But instead of talking about what's most important, it's interesting that they begin to question him about this temple. I guess our question is, is what was their focus it's a really good question for us today. What's, what's our focus? Uh, sometimes, family, we can, we can be so focused on, um, on temporal things. Well, we, we, we put so much uh, energy into temporal things, things um, in, the, in the scope of, 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 uh, of life, of eternal life, 
probably has little value, but yet we invest so much into these temporal things. It's like the world says, hey, you need to put all your attentions here and here and here. And I've not been to the end of my life yet, but I'm sure when I get there, I'm not going to say, I wish I had more things. <laughs> I'm not going to say, I, I wish <laughs> I, I would have spent more money on this, or I wish I would have, you know, purchased this. You know, when it comes to the end, I want to, <laughs> I wish I would have prayed more. <laughs> I wish I would have worshipped more. I wish I would have stepped out of my boat more. I wish I would have trusted Jesus to move mountains more. I, you know, I wish I would have done all of these um, kingdom things more. But, but here the disciples are going in verse 3. It says they sat on the opposite of the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. And they, they asked him privately, tell us when these things will be. What will be the sign uh, when all these things will be fulfilled. You'll see a picture here of uh, Mount Olives, and uh, Lord willing, next year or the following year, we want to go to Israel, and we'd love to have so many of you go. It is a phenomenal trip. The flight's long, but it is, it is worth it just being in Jerusalem and seeing uh, the Bible come alive. So here we have the inner circle of Peter, James, and John, but then we also have Andrew. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about Andrew. He's mentioned about four times in, uh, in the, the, the book of Mark. But they're asking him, when are these things, when will they be uh, fulfilled? When are these things going to happen? So what glimpse into the future does Jesus give us? He says this in verse 5. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. Our next point this morning is be careful no one deceives you. Now, we've had a really great picture of, uh, of deception these last several years. Whenever in, in, in human history have you ever said, man, that sounds good, that sounds good, who's lying, who's telling the truth? Isn't that kind of crazy now? You have to say, I need to re listen real close. Okay, say it again, because everybody sounds like they're telling the truth, but somebody lying. Somebody lying. And, and what happens is, is that there's then these, these two groups. Well, they believe this person and these folks believe this other person. And it, there becomes issues. Because deception is so deceptive, right? It's kind of like I, we almost, well, now we definitely need the Holy Spirit's discernment when it comes to truth. But I can uh, assume that all of us have had issues with friends and family members who may believe what we might believe as, as a deception. So you're talking to them, they're talking to you, they think you're deceived, you think you're deceived, and it's all on the same matter. Jesus here is, is telling them, take heed that no one deceives you. I'm quite sure we've all been deceived at some point in our lives where somebody told us something, we're like, that sounds good. Oh, man, that sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. And you're like, oh, I was deceived. What appeared to be true was actually false. Uh, Ephesians 5, 6, it says, it says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of, of disobedience. Empty words. Colossians, he goes on and says this in 2, 8. It says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So Jesus is letting us know, the apostle Paul is letting us know that there's going to be deception. There's going to be these, these empty words, and I don't watch a lot of news, thank you, Jesus. But <laughs> Empty words when you do tune in, just empty words, empty promises, all of this philosophy. Well, if we would just do this and begin to do this and start doing this, that's what's been going on since Texas, right? Well, let's, this is the issue. The issue is sin. There is no law that's going to fix sin. No matter what we do, no law can ever bring about morality. Even with uh, the, 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 the laws that are, uh, that are coming up that possibly will be overturned, it's not going to make anyone more moral. Only Jesus saves us. Only Jesus gives us hope. So we can pass all of these bills. It's not going to make anyone moral. There's just going to be all of these, these empty words and these philosophies. And Jesus says, watch out for this. Be careful that that no one deceives you. And we live in a, in a day and age that if you stand up against something, 
you're almost you're almost uh, um, um, ostracized because you have chosen not to be deceived. Like 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 for some for, for some reason, you standing for for biblical truth that we're somehow deceived. That's where our our world is. Jesus goes on and it says, "For many will come in my name, saying that I am He, and will what deceive." many. This is possibly referring to Revelation chapter 6, the rider on the white horse, this false messiah, this antichrist. Now, what's, what's crazy is that when this antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to deceive many by these lying signs of wonders. It's crazy in the Bible that there were signs and wonders and no one really believed. But then when the deceiver comes on the scene to purposely deceive with signs and wonders, everyone's going to believe him. Isn't that crazy that that's our nature? Jesus does signs and wonders. The religious don't believe him. The Antichrist will come on the scene and do signs and wonders, and he is going to deceive many. If we were to ask ourselves today, are there any areas in your life where you have been deceived? Are there are any areas in your life where you've been deceived, and not just by maybe a friend, but maybe have you been deceived by, by a pastor? I mean, sometimes I uh, run into people and I haven't seen in a little while, and, you know, they were, they were really into church, and they said, well, you know, the pastor said something to me, and I haven't been to church in 10 years. I'm going, well, what does the pastor got to do with you worshiping some Jesus? You see... They were deceived that this guy said something that offended me. So all of a sudden now me and, me and God, uh, we don't really talk anymore. They were, they were deceived. <laughs> Tell the individual, Jesus never said, follow my people. Jesus said, follow, follow me. Jesus never said, look at my, look at my followers. Go follow them. Yeah, we'd all get lost. <laughs> Walking off cliffs stepping in all kinds. Help me, Jesus, right? He says, come, come follow, come follow me. And, and, and maybe you, you, you've heard something. Maybe somebody told you, hey, you weren't, you weren't beautiful. You weren't intelligent. And maybe some of you are, are still holding on to that deception today. But the Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So this week, take a walk uh, take a, a, a mental little checklist of, of, uh, of things in your life. Is there any area in my life where I am being deceived? Is there any area in my life where truth does not reign? This should be a good week for all of us. Some of you are going to need two pieces of paper. Because right? <laughs> the crazy thing is, is that if we don't correct the deception, we're going to live in that deception. Not only are we going to live in that deception, we're going to blame God. He's going to be like, hey, be a seeker of truth. So if there's any area of deception in your life, we, we, need, to, we need to address this. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus says, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to do what? Deceive. Deceive. If possible, even the elect. So None of us are exempt from deception. None of us are. That's why Holy Spirit, fill me, keep me close to truth, that I don't live a life of, of deception. Then I'm also able to know the difference between truth and deception. For instance, if, if, I, were to, if I were to hold, pour some salt in this hand and some sugar in this hand, how would you know the difference? You would have, once you taste it, you would know the difference, but on sight, you wouldn't know. Jesus, help us to know what, what your truth is. Well, he goes on and he says in verse 7 and 8, he says, but, but when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Our next point this morning is the world's troubles will continue to escalate. <laughs> I'm not sure about you, but I'm going, oh my goodness, continue to escalate? I am so glad the church will not be here for the great tribulation. It's bad now. It is bad now. Can you imagine 
what it's going to be like when all of these things break forth. Now, Jesus says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, it says, it says, don't be troubled. Are you troubled today, Christian? Are you, are you troubled today with the, the things you see? Jesus says, hey, don't, don't be troubled when you hear of these things. Don't, don't, don't hear of these things and, and lose all hope. Jesus says, don't be troubled that you and I should say, okay, we're, it sounds like we're right, we're right where we should be. Yeah, this, this, these things are going to happen. You hear about this on the news or you see this, you're like, go. Oh. You're like, yeah, Mark, thir- yeah, Mark 13, yeah, I think we're right on, we're, we're right on target. Jesus says, don't be, be troubled. Why? Because he's given you and I this peace. Not only this, he's given us his peace. Listen to what he says in John 14, 27. Peace. I leave with you. He says, my peace. Let's push pause for a second. Uh, have you noticed that our peace is fleeting? <laughs> like I can say it for myself. When, when I'm trying to give myself peace, I'm like, oh, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah, just yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. It's like so fleeting because when something comes in that's greater than me, I'm like, oh, Jesus. But Jesus says here, I'm leaving you my peace. It says, my peace I give you. It says, not as the world gives do I give give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I love that that Jesus is saying, hey, my people, my children, don't be afraid. I'm giving you my peace. I'm giving you my joy. I'm giving you what's, what's from me to you. And I don't know about you, but Jesus does all things. Well, Jesus, help us to hold on more to this, to, to your peace. If, if it's our peace, it's going to be like trying to, trying to hold some water. But if it's Jesus' peace, oh, may it just clothe you and I with his peace that, that no matter, look at this, no matter what, what happens in, in, in our lives, we know that God is sovereign over these things. And now I know some things in life are, are really painful and, and suffering is difficult. And it's sometimes hard to, to rectify uh, the sovereignty of God and, and, and pain and suffering. But God is still God and God is great. And he says you can, we can have this peace that he has, he has given us. You know what's, what's crazy? You and I can go on a cruise to the other side of the world The day before the cruise is over, we're thinking about work and emails. Your cell phone doesn't even work where you are. And you're already thinking about the issues that are waiting for you when you get home. That's not peace. That's called an expensive vacation. (laughs) Jesus says you can have this, this peace. So when there's wars and rumors of wars, it says such things must happen, but the end is, is not yet. Crazy times that we're living in, and it's going to continue to to escalate. So far, we've learned that it's all going away. Be careful that no one deceives you, and the world's troubles will continue to escalate. Next, we're going to learn number two. Following Jesus will come at a cost. Following Jesus will come at a cost. Jesus was he began to let the disciples know what things to look for, what things will be revealed. Now he's going to f- switch the flashlight right on to them. This is what's going to happen over here, but now let me talk about you. What does Jesus say in verse 9 and following? He says, but watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to to all nations. There are seven wills stated from verse 9 to verse 13. It sounds a lot like Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen to his disciples. Well, he says, well, watch out for for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to to councils. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John will be arrested. In Acts chapter 6, Stephen will be arrested. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas will be imprisoned. Now, you may say, well, that's, you know, 
few thousand years ago. What does that got to do with us? Uh, you'll see a picture here on the screen of a, of a brother. His name is uh, Pastor Coates. He's a, a pastor in, in Canada, and Canada is still uh, experiencing a lot of uh, uh, COVID lockdown still uh, to this day. I believe you can't come into Canada unless you um, have been uh, been vaccinated. Well, if you've not read his story, it's it's a uh, it's a very interesting one. So this this brother here was thrown into jail with criminals, rapists, um, arsonists, just criminals. So you have this guy that's all about the gospel of Jesus. Uh, thrown in jail because he didn't uh, close his church uh, during the COVID mandate. But regardless of how you feel about the COVID issue, even in his even in his church, they 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 created a a, a COVID section where they put up plexiglass uh, to keep their uh, the congregants you know uh, segregated if that's what they if they felt most comfortable. So they were following the safety protocols, but. The police continued to come uh, to the church, and eventually he was arrested, although they had social distancing in the church, also plexiglass uh, for those that felt comfortable, and also masks in the church, and he still went to jail. You're thinking, you're going to jail with the dirge of society. Hey, wh- hey what'd you do to get in here? Oh, just at church. <laughs> I don't want to know how why you're here. And this is a, a modern day that when you when you do stand for for what one believes is is biblical, there's going to be some issues. Now, again, regardless of how you feel about what he should or shouldn't do, I give up that brother an amen. That that standing up for for your convictions, and if that means we go to jail, then. Let's go to jail and write our name on the wall, right? <laughs> Pastor Henry was here, right? I mean, because if not family, what has happened is um, Christians who were on the sidelines were throwing stones at this guy. I mean, believers that have done nothing for, for the kingdom of God or just, well, why didn't he just close his church and do all of these things? Well, maybe, maybe God told him he shouldn't. Maybe God says, hey, you want to ride this whole Jesus thing out? And he says, yep. He says, okay, you're going to jail. He said, let's go. And and the reason I say that is is we must be be willing to to stand for truth. And and truth isn't popular, as we know. You stand for truth, you're going to be ostracized. You stand for truth, well, you know, you should do this, and we need to, you know, follow the government, which which we should. We know know Romans, Romans 12, we follow everything until... (laughs) <laughs> until government and this divide. <laughs> we're, all, we're on track, but then when they go this way, we need to say, well, we're going to follow this, and following this, it's going, to, it's going to cost us something. And I tell you what, that brother is, uh, I think he's great. I think he's great for, for standing up uh, for what he believes God has led him to do. Think about this. Most, most followers of Jesus in America will probably never taste uh, persecution like this. Will will we'll, we'll probably uh, uh, will probably never step out of their comfort zone enough to even be, be mentioned in, 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 in a conversation of, of courageous people. And I don't say that as a slam, but I say that sometimes we live such comfortable lives where we're just like, I'm just going to go with the flow. I'm just going to kind of just, uh, I just want to be in the shadows and I don't want to be under the radar. What I love about this, this pastor, Pastor Coates, is he's not trying to be popular. He's just trying to honor Jesus. And, and if, and if, and if uh, attempting to honor Jesus is a bad thing, then all of us should be bad. All of us should be bad. If, 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 if our actions, if somebody asks you, why are you doing what you're doing? I'm just trying to honor Jesus the best I can. To that I say, go, brother. I'll send you some, some money on your little card or whatever they do for you when you're in jail. You know, we want to lift you up and support you. 
Listen to what, you'll see this quote on the, on the screen here. If following Jesus has cost you nothing, then you aren't following the biblical Jesus. If following Jesus has cost you nothing, then you're not following the, the biblical Jesus. Let me read you one thing in Hebrews and then, we'll, and then we'll continue. In Hebrews chapter 11, it is a beautiful, beautiful passage. It's the, it's the passage of faith. And Hebrews 11, listen to verse 36 through 38. And it says, still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Yes, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Listen to verse 38. Of whom the world was not worthy. Dang. Dang. Destitute. Trials of mockings and scourgings, and the word of God says the world was not worthy of them. It's like, wow. We, we want to be in, in that conversation where we're following Jesus is going to cost us something. Now, I'm, saying, I'm not saying we need to be crazy, right? We need to be crazy out there, but we need to follow Jesus. Holy Spirit, does that make sense? Holy Spirit filled, uh, following Jesus, and they're will be a cost. And maybe some of you have lost some friends, some family members, as we'll talk about as we continue in our text. Well, verse 10, it says, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. <laughs> this is simple, family. Everything is about the gospel. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And verse 10, it doesn't say, and uh, we first need to overthrow the Roman government. First, you need to do this, and first, you need to do that. No, he says, when it comes uh, time towards the end, it says it's the gospel that must first be preached. It's the gospel. So we have signs everywhere that our, our mandate, our, our desire is, is to preach the gospel because there's no other uh, avenue of change. There's no other way for uh, a heart to be redeemed. There's no other way for you and I to find uh, eternal joy because the world is not giving us the world gives us temporal joy, and we keep going back for temporal things when Jesus offers us a meal. We're just going back for snacks. Jesus, help us. This gospel must first be preached. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. As Brother Keith was sharing this morning, he's given you the gospel. Born of a virgin, died on a cross for our sins, lived a sinless life. We need to preach this Jesus. We need to preach this, this gospel. Paul called himself a bondservant, a, a slave of Jesus. What separated him? It was the gospel. He was saved by the gospel. Uh, you and I can uh, argue with people. We can try to convince people. We can try to get them to vote a certain way. What about the gospel? Let me give you the gospel. Once I give you the gospel, everything else will work itself out. <laughs> once I give you the, the gospel and you receive the gospel, once your, your heart is transformed, once you, you, you have some Jesus hope and Jesus joy and Jesus has transformed, <laughs> transformed you, you're going to live the right way. You're going to vote the right way. You're going to love the right way. But it only comes through the gospel. So I want to encourage all of you. Let, and, and let's stay focused on the gospel. Stay focused on the gospel. There's no other avenue of change that God has given but this gospel. Verse 11, it says, but when they arrest you, not if, when they arrest you and deliver you up, uh, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. Sounds a lot like Jesus knows what's going to happen. But whatever is given you in that hour, it says, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Oh, how you and I need the Holy Spirit to speak through us today. Sometimes I think we're do, we do a lot of speaking, and the Holy Spirit says, I got something better better to say. Can you, can you stop talking for a second so I can, kill me, so I, so I can say something? Jesus, help us that, that the Holy Spirit would, would speak to us. Have you ever had somebody give you like a, a timely word? Anybody? 
you're talking to somebody and they just, you just, you're talking to them. You may not feel anything, but you say something and they go, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, reso- that's, the, that's from the Holy Spirit and it's, and it's resonating. So Jesus is saying, when all of these things happen, you don't have to premeditate before and what are you going to speak? No, the, the Holy Spirit is going to tell you what to say. We saw this in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen gave them that great, beautiful history lesson. And James is a very practical book. James 1.5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, it will be given to him. So what I try to do in my conversations, and I need to do it more often, is that before I respond, Holy Spirit, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom that, that, when, that when I say something, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be biblical, it's going to resonate, uh, it's going to speak of you. So while someone's talking, you're just praying, Spirit of God, give me, give me words uh, to encourage. Uh, give, me, give me wisdom and, 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 and then just trust that, that what's said is it, biblical and it's from the Lord. And, and I'll tell you what, it's a beautiful thing when someone says, and I, I don't know how you knew, but hey, you spoke right to my situation. We're like, hey, praise, praise Jesus for being, for being so good. Well, verse 12, it says, now brother will betray brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Now, this uh, doesn't happen much in the United States, but in some of the uh, Middle Eastern countries, you see, you've read where, you know, the brothers have burned their sister alive. So although this hasn't hit our doorstep, I am quite sure something is coming. Brother will betray brother to death and his father, his child. In David Barrett's book called Today's Martyrs, he says some 165,000 Christians have died for their faith in the year 2000. 165,000. We don't hear much about that in the the Western world, but maybe you're online and maybe you're going to see this video in 5, 10, 20 years uh, from now. I want to tell you, hold on, brother. Hold on, sister, hold fast to Jesus. Verse 13, and it says, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. How do you feel about that, family? You will be hated by all. Now, some of you, you like to be liked. Do you like me? Don't unfriend me. Don't snooze me for a week. I want you to like me. I'm kind, I'm, I'm gentle, I'm caring, I'm compassionate. Then they'll mess around and ask you a question about morality and you'll talk to them about what the Bible says and you might lose a friend or two or a family member or two. Jesus says you will be hated by all. How do you feel about that? <laughs> hated by all. Oh, here she comes. Bible thumper, here he comes, Mr. Bible thumper. You go to a family picnic or something or a little celebration, here comes Jesus and his disciples, all right? Here they come, judging all of us drinking beer. Mm-hmm. You gonna pray for the food? Go ahead, we got to give you 10 minutes, all right? We're gonna be hated, it says, by all for Jesus. John 15, 18 It says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Isn't that crazy? Think about it. it. Jesus came into the world loving, serving, uh, uh, casting out demons, giving hope, bringing people back to life, feeding multitudes, giving peace and joy. And in the end, they killed him. So we tend to think that if Jesus were alive today, he'd be embraced by the masses. Mm -mm. He would right up until he began talking about heaven, hell, and morality. Same thing would happen to him in the Bible today. Same thing today would happen to him as what it did in the Bible. They would hate Jesus if he was walking around in 2022. He'd be hated. They'd love the miracles. It'd be all on Facebook and Instagram, all of these things. But then they would say, hey, here's a clip of what Jesus just said about this issue. They wouldn't follow him any longer. They would start to hate. They would say, what can we do to get rid of this guy? 
they hated Jesus, they're going to hate us. Think about this, family. If they, if they hated Jesus, and if you and I are following Jesus, that same hate is going to come down to us. The crazy thing could be if they hate Jesus, but you want people to like you. No, if they hated Jesus, to, to, to be a Christian means little Christ. So you and I are, are acting like a little Jesus. So they can't hate big Jesus and then love little Jesus. Now, if, if they hate big Jesus and love some little Jesus, you and I are probably doing something wrong. You and I probably aren't properly representing big Jesus. When you and I represent big Jesus, there is going to be some issues. Verse 13, the latter part says, but he who endures to the end shall be, shall be saved. You notice that everything that Jesus described here in this text, it was difficult. But he didn't say, well, guys, the end's going to be, it's not going to be so bad. There's going to be some troubled points, but you're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. It's going to be easy. You'll, you'll, you'll get through. No, Jesus clearly tells them that following him is going to be tough. Anybody ever been there? I'm not sure about you, but following three of us, five of us, all right. Following Jesus sometimes is so tough because we're, we're working out our own, our own salvation with fear and trembling. We're, we're working out this and working out that, and, and, and sometimes it, it, it is difficult. But Jesus says, but he who endures to the end. There's something to, to no matter what happens, I'm following Jesus. That, that no matter what, what, what I don't have or no matter what I have and it's taken from me, I'm still following Jesus. There's, there's something to Jesus. All of my chips are in that, that my, 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 my relationship with you is not based upon my, my comfort level, uh, my financial level, my health level. Jesus, I'm following you because you were God in the flesh. That, that's, what I, that's what I'm doing. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I've decided to follow Jesus to the end. If it's difficult, if it's hard, if I struggle, if I cry, I'm following Jesus to the end. And I say, not all believers are like that. You know, we get a, we get a migraine headache. God, where are you? It's like, a, easy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pass. Family, there's something to, to enduring. There's something to being convinced. Uh, there's something to to hold it on because that's all you have. There's something to clinging to Jesus. So how's your grip, family? I'm not asking how's, how's it going in your life. I'm asking you, how's your grip? How is your, your grip? Because as long as you and I are gripped to Jesus, everything's going to be okay. Amen. Everything is going to be okay as long as we hold on to Jesus. Now, holding on to Jesus doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. We're not going to cry. We're not going to have any pain. We're not going to have any doubt. We're not going to um, experience uh, uh, sufferings. But we know who is over, who's Lord over all of those things. So how is your, how is your, your grip? In the Bible in John chapter 6, which is a phenomenal chapter, make sure you read it when you have an opportunity. John 6, verse 66 and 68. Well, Jesus had laid out what uh, his qualifications were to follow him. And it says this in John 6, 66. From that time, many of his what? Disciples. Not regular old people. Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Think about, think about this. Then we got to go. They saw all the miracles heard all the greatest sermons. They knew to some extent who he was. He laid out what it takes to follow him. And it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. There was no grip. There was no grip. And grip says, Jesus, I don't get what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. But listen to what Peter says. Jesus turned to to his 12, and he says, do you also want to go away? I love Jesus, right? People are walking away. He turns to his own 12, and he says, hey, how are you guys doing? Why are you still here? Do you want to leave like the rest? Push pause. Look at that. They're all leaving. This is, this is your opportunity. Do you, do you want to leave with the rest? Listen to Peter. Love this guy. 
He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words to eternal life. Where are we going, Jesus, if we leave you? If you and I no longer came to church, where are you going? There's no one else that has the words to eternal life. Where are we going? So we must ask, how's your grip? How is your grip? There's something to, to enduring, to trusting. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Oh, my. He said, I'm holding on. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. My hopes are is that you would say, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm all in to clinging and holding on to you. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm suffering right now. I don't know the future. I don't, I don't know what's happening, but, but I'm holding on to you. That's enduring to the end, family. That's enduring till the end. Let me give you three things to take home with you. The first one is, how can you arrange your life to focus on eternal things? How can you arrange your life to focus on eternal things? Secondly, do you find yourself being troubled when Jesus said, do not be troubled? Do you find yourself being troubled when Jesus said, do not be troubled? And then thirdly, what tools do you have to endure hardship as a follower of Jesus. What tools do you have to, to endure it? If you don't have any tools and you're going through hardship, it's probably really, 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 really difficult for you. But when you and I have the tools to endure hardship, when you and I have the tools together, to endure hardship. I'm not sure about you, but when, when, we're, when we're sharing the load, it's a, it's a little lighter. But some of you are, ta-da, ta-da. <laughs> I got it. I don't need anybody. I can walk by myself. That's not Bible. So let's cling to the word of God and let's walk together. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this glimpse, this glimpse of some of the things that are going to take place in the end and what great applications we've, we've had today. Jesus, we ask that you would help us to, to keep you in, in, in your rightful place. And it's not that you move, it's we move. You are high and you're enthroned in glory. You know all the things that are going to happen. And Jesus, you know that sometimes we, we have this great struggle with, with pain and suffering, uh, the future. Sometimes, Jesus, we just, we just lose sight of you. Not that you've moved, but we've moved. So, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm asking that you would help us all just to, to, to cling to you, that our grip upon you would be great, that we would just hold on to you and hold on and hold on and hold on. Be magnified, Jesus, in our weakness Jesus, forgive us for just not trusting as we should. Forgive us for having our eyes on temporal things instead of eternal things. We know you are good. We know that you are just and true and great. Keep drawing us closer and closer. And maybe you're here today, friend, or you're online, and uh, Jesus isn't the Lord of your life, that you are living your life by your own rules and you're trying to find joy and peace. I want to tell you that Jesus offers joy and peace, restoration and forgiveness and an and eternal hope and future in him. And if you want an eternal hope and future, if you want transformation, it's only found, lasting transformation is only found in Jesus. So let's pray together. If you desire Jesus, the simple prayer to the Father is, Father in heaven, forgive me a sinner. Jesus, I believe you lived a sinless life. I believe you were born of a virgin. I believe you died on a cross for my sins and you rose again the third day. Oh, Jesus, be my Lord. I'm calling out for you to save me, to forgive me of my sins. All that I possess and all that I am, it's yours. I ask these things in Jesus' name.
If you said that prayer and you're online, click the link that says, I just gave my life to Jesus. I'd love to write you a letter this week. And if you're in here, I'd love to meet you. Lord, bless our journey with you. Bless my brothers and sisters as we leave this place, thinking about your goodness and your greatness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And the church said...